Hello and welcome to this Without Walls message. It's so great to have you join us. Each week we upload a new message that is at the heart of what God is saying. We pray that you are enriched and moved by God's Word today. Okay, so Rachel, be blessed. Father, we just thank you for Rachel. Father, we thank you for the gift she is to this fellowship, Father. And we just receive of her, Lord, this morning. The gift that's on her life, Lord, we receive and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I, when they asked me to speak, I said to um, Ash, I'm so aware how it goes here that it could be an hour or it could be 20 minutes. Um, so I have a full teaching, but I'm not going to go into the fullness. I want to honor people's time. We've got baptisms at one. But I am going to teach um, stuff I feel that all of us already know. Such a prophetic church, and you're so aware of everything. But I feel like it's what our responses and how we how we can steward that. Is that all right? So I'm just going to sit with you for a bit rather than teach, teach, teach. So it is the year of uh, the open door. So Hebrew year 5, 7, 8, 4, the year of the open door. You know, John 10, 7 says, I am the door. And then he goes on to say, I'm the shepherd. And then John 10, 10, you would have life and life abundant. And so when we think of the door, we're thinking of the way, the truth, and the life. It's Jesus, the open door. And um, just a fuller scope of what that might mean um, prophetically. I love seasons, and I kind of, I'm a bit of a sensate, so I'll feel things in the atmosphere. Are you guys comfy? I feel like everything got covered in the worship and the, and the prophesying afterwards. So maybe I'm just bringing some seasonal context to what already is being accomplished. But, um, oh, Jesus, we just thank you that you're speaking. It was so rich this morning. I'm so grateful for your leadership. Ash and Hills, Jeanette, just to follow the spirit like that. He was just... I love that you love the fragrance of Jesus. It was so beautiful this morning. The whole dialogue was so sweet. We're so grateful, God. Whew, for the readiness and the stewardship in this church, we're just so grateful. Oh, so some context. 2020, um, we have a son who is six and a daughter who is four. And had some concerns around some of the parenting. So I'm... I used to be a senior leader in a beautiful church in, in south of the river, and I was in a sabbatical season, and then after that, the Lord pulled me out completely, which was a big season of grief for me. I dreamed we would be there forever. So completely, you know, the Lord just said, this is not it, you're moving out, and I had not pictured that. But my mind was not on church leadership things. I wasn't thinking in that sphere. I was thinking of my home, and I was praying for my children, and I couldn't sleep. So I went out into the lounge, got on my face, and I was just interceding so that it could lift, you know, this worry, this burden. And um, I suddenly saw this picture, and it was this big ancient door, and it was only slightly ajar. You know when you walk down a hallway and it's dark, and then there's this ajar door, and the light sort of seeps out? So this had this ancient door, and it was slightly ajar, and the light was seeping out, and it was blue, so blue. And I thought, this is not the conversation we're having. You're talking about something else. I'm talking about my children, and you're telling me something different. So I said, okay, explain. You know, and I'm in this posture. I'm bowing down before this ancient door. And all I could feel, I had no understanding, but I knew it was a seasonal picture. Like, this is what's going on in this season, not just for me, for the church globally, 2020. This ajar door, and I, all I could feel, which to be honest wasn't what I was, my posture wasn't in this mindset, but it was, I must take my brothers with me. I must take my brothers with me. And I felt this awareness that this is a door that's opening, and I must take my brothers with me. I must take my street with me. So, partnered with a revelation of something opening before me was this deep cry of intercession, which was. Interesting, <laughs> you know, brain dump that somewhere. We're now coming up to the year of the open door. And um, 
what I feel has happened 2020, 2021, 2022, here we are, 2023, is this door, this door has slowly become more and more ajar. And it has been sifting us. Because when you go through a threshold, first of all, it must be done in humility. But this open door is that Jesus is the way. There is one Lord, one King, one great I am. And we can say that and decree that. And we can even do, you know, the journey of, oh, I'm struggling with this. I want to come back to his Lordship. But it's like he's sifting continually all over again so that we can enter that doorway clean. Because when we enter with a pure heart, we will see God. But it means that when the wind blows on what has been burnt, the fire will go. It will spread far. It needs a pure heart for the water to flush through. So the era that we're entering into is the rulership and the reigning of God. When you see in Revelations 15, it talks about the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb and how it's the song that the end time church sings. Because they're overcoming the beast. And this is what they sing. And we can sometimes categorize the song of Moses as that's what happened way long ago. And then the song of the lamb is something that will be for the end time church. They'll sing it when the beast comes. <laughs> and then Jesus overcomes the beast. But that word says overcoming the beast. In Hebrew it means continually overcoming. That's because the end time church will, even if their overcoming is through persecution and death, they sing a song of victory because the Lord has been Lord in that. But it is us because we are the church and we are continually overcoming the beast of the flesh. It is our song. It is our song. The great exodus that Israel went through is the same overcoming song of every believer. That we would overcome the beast, which means that he is no longer Lord in us. Now we look at that and we go big fiery dragon thing when really it's the flesh. It's when we're in our circumstance, which is very real. And are we submitting to the fear of the pain or the grief or the bitterness? Are we submitting to that? And is it enthroned or is he enthroned in our season and Lord? The only way it works, which has been so taught here and supported even through you know, the equipping of what's the inner healing school that they're doing? The, speed is, yeah, the emotionally healthy. This is so that your heart may be sifted. That is to equip us so that we have a right response of lordship before the Lord. It's a tool so that we can enter into his lordship fully. Because there's places that can confuse us and we get stuck. It's not to produce shame or to tell you you're behind. It's so that you can steward yourself before the Lord and come in with a mature response to him of, I'm going to own this because I want a mature response before the Lord. It's by his grace. It's by his mercy. It's by his timing. There's no rush to how you can heal. <laughs> I wish it was quicker. <laughs> but it's his timing. Just like he grows a garden, he will do the seasons with you. But it has our yielding and it has our partnership. It must. So this is how this church is just incredible and how it equips. But then it comes through in that the worship goes as long as he would like it to because he's enthroned upon our... There's right order that must come, right? So we're talking about overcoming that beast. That, that scripture in Revelation 15, just two to four, it actually connects us to... Let's be aware of the time. I'm good. It connects us to Psalm 73. And it's a psalm from Asaph, who was a priest. We are a royal priesthood. And he says at the beginning, God is good to those who are pure in heart. It's a really important statement. He's good to those who are pure in heart. That's our response of love. Keep me pure. Search my heart, O oh God. Right? That's the way we worship. Clean hands, pure heart. He says he's good to those who are pure in heart. And then he follows through with, but I nearly lost that. And then for a good 12 to 13 verses, he talks about how he looked at those who either didn't follow the Lord or those who were Christians but were getting the benefits and he wasn't. And he looks at them and he complains. How come they can slander and I can't? How come they get a blessing and fruit and my fruit hasn't come? And he goes through the frustrations and the limitations he's feeling and they are real. They are real. How the last three years, they are real. The, the last 39 years, they are real. But his eye is on these things. 
these things, these things, how come? Frustration. So his eye is on the realities of his circumstances and the injustice of things and the things that feel like they could be strangling or limiting him. They're real things. And then he says, and then I entered the presence of God and I understood. This means I came into his presence. I came face to face with the Lord and clarity came back to my mind. Right order came. He says, when I was not in your presence, I behaved foolishly. I was in great grief and great sorrow. Those are real things. And I behaved like a beast before you. Connection to Revelation 15. It's talking about the beast inside and how he has dominance. Unless our gaze is on the presence of God. Right? He says, I was like a beast. And he talks about how he was senseless and ignorant. That senseless is like lacking in wisdom, lacking in the fear of God. That ignorance is actually like, I don't know you. And I don't know me. St. Augustine says, help me know myself that I might know you. We have to know the state of our heart. We need to capture every thought and put it before the Lord. Help me know myself that I might know you. When we sing about the glory of his name, we can get a bit kind of lost in the language. It's so familiar to us. But you know, when, when the temple was built, when David wanted to build the temple, yes, the tabernacle, but the temple, the Lord said, build a temple. This is my house for the glory of my name. And the whole way through, it's the glory of his name, the glory of his name. Like, Yahweh, Jesus, like what is it about coming under his name? When he talks about his name, he's talking about his nature, his character. I can trust you because I know your heart. It's talking about his heart. Do you know what gets you through the hard seasons? The glory of his heart. You know his heart. You know how he's going to treat you. It's going to be good. John 10, I am the door. He says in the next line, I'm the shepherd. We need to know in this season we are being led by a very good shepherd. Very good shepherd. It might not look like what you want. In fact, I think this sifting and especially the magnitude of how it's been last month, this month, and the next is unto the year that will come that might be quite hard. But I see a glory of the Lord where the light shines brighter than the darkness because we have come into the light. We have come into the light because we know his heart. Be glorified in his temple doesn't mean I get to roll on the floor laughing. That's wonderful. It's that your lordship and your name has rulership in here. In every season, not just the fire in this time from 9 till 10. It's the fire in my conversations with my spouse. It's the fire of God when I'm dealing with people that I have conflict with. It's the fire of God in how I handle offense and how I've been treated by my brother. It's the fire of God in our lives where we hold ourselves accountable with the fear of the Lord, that this must be a temple where your glory comes through in this hour. Nothing must hinder what you want to do in this hour. So we look at that scripture of Asaph and he goes on, nevertheless, this is who the Lord has been to me when I came into his presence. And he lists him off. I can even go through it in a minute if there's time. But how he lists him off leads us to Isaiah 11. How he describes him, Isaiah 11, and that's talking about the sevenfold spirit of God. It describes him, Jesus, who will reign as the one who comes from the stump of Jesse. Why do they say that instead of saying he's, you know, in the lineage of David, they say the stump of Jesse. Do you know why? Because Jesse was nobody and Jesus came in pure humility. They're describing the rulership from humility in Jesus. So they say, from the stump of Jesse, there comes a ruler. Then they describe him as the one who will walk in the sevenfold spirit of God. All of it, not some of it. Because this is the song of Moses, which is where they had to consume the whole lamb. And then they were delivered. In this hour, we must take in the whole of Jesus, the whole of the spirit. He must have permission in every area of our hearts. We don't pick and choose where we want his lordship. We don't pick and choose what our faith looks like. We don't come in for comfort in Christianity. He is the comforter. And it's gotten us through so far because we're a maturing people. There are seasons where he feeds you like a baby. Thank you, Jesus. He makes it about you. Praise God. <laughs> he like raises us into him. And then it comes into seasons where we go, actually, it's the Song of Songs thing where he knocks on the door to her and she says, 
you've already given me robes of salvation, of righteousness. You've won me. I'm going to go to heaven one day. I believe in you. Our fellowship is great. I'm tired now. I'm going to have a nap. I'll catch you later. This is what she says in Song of Songs. And he says, I'm knocking. Come with me up the mountain of suffering. Because he's saying, you've received salvation. Now come into friendship. Come know my heart. Join me in my suffering. Really hard to do if pain and suffering are still idols in our heart. Because then we're like, no thanks. Cannot handle anymore. Very real for some of us who are in pain. This is not a shame word. It means it's a time for healing. Because what is next is that we can come into him not afraid of death. Not afraid of death. That we would not love our lives according to that way. But that we would say, come what may, we must have you, Jesus. We must have you. Do you know what the mountain of suffering is? It's indecision that we would feel his heart for people. He wants us to be healed and whole so that we would join him as the high priest interceding so that we would say, my heart is pure before you come through me and rule and reign. Isaiah 11 talks about him consumed by the spirit. And then he says, then the beast will lie down with the lamb. And then the child will play with the cobra, praise God. And it talks about all these descriptions of lordship. The ruling and reigning of Jesus, which we can sometimes categorize as end time. It's now in here. And that beast is the same beast. It's the same beast. And the fruit of it is not just my sanity and right order. It's that when Jesus rules and reigns in me, it manifests. And the land receives right order. As it should. When you see principalities in a region, it's a, it's a mass of people who have come into agreement with a lie. When priesthoods come together in agreement with truth, what is raised up? The Lord is enthroned in their midst. A higher truth comes into play. When we come into lordship, it manifests. It, is, it has to be more than just me. It must be for this nation. For the bride... Because there's many of the bride who are stuck and blind and for the lost. So here we are recognizing (laughs) these, this journey that we're in and the last month. So we've got August. I start to feel, this is common language for a lot of (laughs) you. I start to feel like "Mm, anxiety in the air (laughs) and I can feel this tension of stress and panic and Self-stewardship is a real big thing for me because I'm a censor. So I'm going to be a bit crazy, but a friend of mine, please don't see this as crass, but a friend of mine said to me, someone needs to write a book that says that was the devil or that was your hormones. (laughs) Because you got to know what's going on, which means I have to manage me really well so I can hear what's going on. Because you can say that was a demon and really you just didn't have enough sleep and you've been eating McDonald's all week, right? (laughs) You've actually got to know that this was designed to live in union with Jesus and you've got to steward it for that. So, and that looks different as seasons, parenting, lack of sleep. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, all of you go to the gym. (laughs) I'm saying you've, you've got to take into the equation that this filter needs to be clean to hear well. And his grace goes beyond and his mercy goes beyond, but it's an act of love to steward self rightly. It's an act of worship. And so here I am sifting stuff, going, hmm. But I've done the last few years in a lot of getting low before the Lord and a lot of sifting and overcoming some of these things that could have won me. It truly, like the war that came upon me in my house that I had to go through meant that I did not have sound mind. And so to be able to sit there and go, oh, I know I'm good. What's going on? It's just such a beautiful confidence and peace in the Lord, right? Praise Jesus. So I'm figuring this all out and I'm like, oh, this is coming up into Rosh Hashanah. It's coming up into the new year because he usually speaks to me about the new year around Rosh Hashanah, not around January 1st. And so I've been leaning into it and I was like, wow, this is noisy, fascinating. (laughs) And all I heard the Lord was saying to me was just rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in everything, no matter what's going to happen. The time. Are we good? And then the next line is, and do not restrain the Holy Spirit. And it's talking to the, like, you know, giving prophetic words and everything. But I felt him say, it must be the fullness of the Holy Spirit that flows through you in this hour, Rach. 
don't stop him. Live in re- the way that that's going to happen is that we live rejoicing. We pray without ceasing. We're just, my eyes are on you, Jesus. And then we give thanks no matter what's coming. That's a real big posture every day. <laughs> when my kids are going crazy, that's a big posture. <laughs> um, and then not to restrain. So I'm looking for what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do through me on what he's doing around me. I'm starting to recognize that in the pure heart, he's going to move in a bigger way in this coming time. And we need to give permission for that. Okay? So I'm feeling that. <laughs> And then about a week later, it comes upon me again. So I'm starting to notice this is intercession. But some of us are like, avoid it, avoid it. I don't want to go through that. And I'm going, that's part of what I agreed to come up the mountain with you, right? Is that I will have a few times that feel like they're taking me out. But it's actually to know you and to know you. The best way I can cope with that kind of hypervigilance and the rubbing, because the instant response to that kind of discomfort is I feel frustrated. Every other prophet in the room goes, I know. (laughs) It's a common (laughs) feeling is frustration. Um, I'm not a prophet, but I'm just saying I'm so aware of those conversations. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go outside and do some weeding. I need to do something with my hands. Um, It's not a time with my kids around that I can just go for a run or something. So I start weeding. And I'm pulling things out by the root, and I'm hearing things in my heart. They're hope deferred. There, um, I wrote some of this down because this is not just for me. It's hope deferred. It's fear, fear of man, fear of pain, fear of rejection, fear of lack financially. Um, I'm feeling things in our season that are things I've often put before the Lord and we talk about. This is not like new to me. I'm feeling fear of failure. And I'm feeling the fear of fear of death. Um, Laying my life down is costly. (laughs) You know, it's nicer to just curl up in my room and hide. (laughs) It's not as satisfying. I don't think I'd be satisfied if I hid. I think it would become very boring to me. But the risk of faith is actually quite terrifying. And I calculate that cost before the Lord. And I've got fear of disappointment. And I have some disappointments. I have cynicism going around in my head. I have hope deferred, I have accusation, I have self-pity, I have a recognition that I don't feel stable and I'd rather feel stable than to be following him. So you're hearing all these other idols. I've processed all of these, I've done a lot of inner healing, but they're all bubbling up again. Um, And I was sitting there going, (laughs) and um, the temptation is to get really caught up and think, oh, I haven't done much healing, I thought I was way more whole than this. Oh, man. Or like, oh, Satan's really plaguing me. Um, But thankfully, I had worship in my ears, and I felt the Lord tuck me in, and he said, pull them out by the root. So I'm like, pulling out these weeds. I've done this before. (laughs) Pulling them out. I didn't look pretty. I just need you to know that. I'm pulling out these things, and then I feel like the sweetness and the goodness of God in the midst of it. and And I'm pulling them out, and I'm like, I don't care. I just want you, Jesus. I don't care. I don't care. I don't, I don't, that fear can't, I don't want it to govern me. I just want you, Jesus. And there was this thing of process where I was like, I've done all of this before, but it's another layer. And I'm taking out, I'm going, I don't care. I just want you, Jesus. I don't care. And I'm feeling this joy fill my heart. I don't care. I just want you. Yes, I feel that frustration financially, but you know what? If that never changes, I don't care. I just want you, Jesus. Oh, this area where health hasn't changed? I don't care. It's not more important. I want you, Jesus. And I'm pulling out these things, and then I hear myself go, Australia just wants you, Jesus. This street just wants you, Jesus. Oh, I'm so sorry for how we've responded to these things. The church just wants you, Jesus. And I'm pulling out roots, and I'm going, oh, You want me to understand what the church must do in this hour. I could have gotten really lost in confusion and like, oh, my life's still a mess. Thankfully, tucking into worship in my ears, I'm gazing on Jesus. And it's like, take out the roots, Rach. This is intercession. The church must just want me. It must be just Jesus. There must be contentment in just Jesus. In your circumstances, is he enough? Is Jesus enough? Even unto death, is he enough? Think of the 
church in Acts, is Jesus enough? When persecution comes, and I can tell you now, he's saying, rend your garments, which Joel 2 says, don't rend your garments. He's saying, rend your heart. Rend your heart. Make your heart bare for me. Let it be open that I can take things out, that I might be ruling and railing there. He says that because what's to come, it's like the tearing of the curtain in the temple. He makes a way. There's a tearing of our hearts. What's to come is people will choose, yes, be Lord. And some in the church will say, no. And we need to be okay to turn around and really love our brother. In this coming hour, our brother will look at us and say, you are being foolish. Because we are running in the wholeness of the Holy Spirit. And we're eating of the whole lamb. And our eyes are seeing things we've never seen. And the light is bright. And yet in the blindness... They will feel wise and say, what are you doing? We disagree. We want to keep on these old things. And that's, there's no judgment. That's the path the Lord is having with them. That's unto Jesus. But our response is, can we love our brother? Can we love each other? Can we love each other? Can we pull each other through? That doesn't happen unless there's a pure heart. We cannot love our brother when there's persecution. We, not, we cannot love in the hour that's to come unless our hearts are in the lordship of Jesus. He's not just leading us that way because he wants to be king. He's leading us that way because he's a very good shepherd. And for what's to come, we better be in the lordship of Jesus. We need to be submitted to him. We need to find our courage in him. We must know his nature and his heart that we might stand firm, that we might respond boldly. It's so essential in this hour that we live in the fear of the Lord. To not be a church that's asleep. To not be a church that eats the bits that are fun. We take the bitter. We take all of it. Yeah? So, <laughs> woo, happy words. Um, so I felt that it was important that we, that we recognize this hour. Some of us walk in this all the time. And I just want to encourage you that the, there's years of maturing in the spirit and, and inner healing and responding to the Lord. Have your way in every moment. But I really want to encourage you that in the magnitude of what's happening as we come into there is only one way. There's only one door. That we look at that not just personally and say, yes, God, Lordship for me. But we recognize that that, that response, that repentance is intercession and that we want to take our brother with us. That's actually our cry. God, as it opens before us, we want to respond rightly. We want to come low and we want to take our brother with us. Yeah? That we would not push away. We would not respond in judgment or accusation. That we would love our brother in the hour to come. So what I felt to do, oh thank goodness I've got five minutes, is, is if, I don't know if you're comfortable with this. This is my suggestion. You can nod or say no. Is I felt... We would pray corporately, a prayer of repentance and just inviting the Lord to have his way. Some stuff you would have already prayed, all of it you've already prayed, but we're doing it as intercession as well today. So we're doing it as the bride. Is that okay? So if you want to stand, I'll pray out a statement and we just say yes or amen. And that's what needs to come off your lips if you feel that in the spirit, in your gut. You say yes, Lord, amen. All right? Oh. Jesus, we love you, we need you, and we want you. Yes, Lord. Oh, and we repent for our exalting of other things, for being led by wounds and lofty thoughts, and not being obedient to Christ, our Lord Jesus. Take out that root, that system, break down that structure, we pray. Oh, we repent for our pride. Oh, for it is the root of every evil. We repent for thinking we can be anything outside of submission and dependence on you. Oh God, it is your hand and it is your glory. Oh, we repent for our apathy, for where our love has been lukewarm, where we've picked and chosen the parts we want from the table you set before us. <laughs> and instead of eating the whole meal, we decide how this relationship should go. And we decide on plans. We've decided the way, the truth, and the life. And we repent for that, Jesus. 
Purify our hearts. Purify our love. Father, we're sorry for thinking we need other things to be happy. That we need greater provision or greater breakthrough. We repent for prioritizing the need for more finances or the need for more friends. All these good things, we repent for making them more than your lordship in our lives. You bring the right season and you bring the right timing. You provide everything we need. So we repent for resenting your ways and your timing. We repent for pushing back on your leadership. Oh, for thinking we know better. Purify our hearts, God. We just want you. And Jesus, we repent for allowing our fears to lead us and to lie to us. We renounce the fear and we renounce the lies. We repent for coming into agreement with other kings and other lies. We've been intimidated by the power even of their feelings and their anxieties. And though they are real and there are gifts and tools at hand for stewardship, we ask that you forgive us and heal us, Lord. For we know that the Holy Spirit is not a spirit of fear. He's a spirit of love. <laughs> oh, he's a spirit of love and of power and a sound mind. So we repent for setting our gaze in accordance with fear, for living life protecting our hearts and our lives when you've actually called us to lay our lives down. We say yes to listening to your wisdom because you are a spirit of wisdom and we repent and we listen to your instruction. You are the spirit of understanding and knowledge. We ask you to steward us and even our humanity where we must do wise choices. We ask that you would steward our humanity well so that we would not be led by fear. We want it to be about you, Jesus. And Jesus, we're so sorry for not joining you, for not desiring to mature in our love beyond the comfort of salvation and the beauty of church culture. When you knock on the door of our hearts and ask us to come away with you to the mountain of suffering, oh, we saw it so beautifully in Sarah this morning. Oh, Jesus, we're sorry where we've refused, where we've been intimidated. We give you our bodies as living sacrifices which includes our hearts and our feelings because we want to know you and your sufferings. We want to feel what you feel for others. We want to love you the way you love you. <laughs> and we want to love others the way you love others. Teach us, Jesus. We want to get caught up in intercession with you. We're sorry for where we've missed out on knowing you and the fullness of what it means to be one with you. Isaiah 11 says, and is ruling and reigning. That's where it quotes, and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. It says the knowledge of the Lord. That's intimate knowledge, not just intellectual knowledge. We want to get caught up in knowing you, Jesus. We're not going to dictate those. Psalm 16 says the boundaries have landed well. It's because he sets them. <laughs> he sets the placing for us in him. We're not going to dictate what's comfortable anymore, what's right. You set that, Jesus. We repent, God, and we ask that you'd assist us to yield to you. We want you. We need you. So we ask that you would come and take every root out. Take every idol and knock it over. Clean the house, God. Clean the house. Fill us. Prepare us. By your mercy, with your Holy Spirit, be enthroned in our lives. Lift our chin, Psalm 3, verse 3, that we might lock eyes with you, God. We set our gaze on the bright, open door, the blinding light that is Jesus. Spirit, we ask that you would lead us in humility. Oh, that in all of what's to come, we would rejoice always. We would pray, which means we would be in union without ceasing. And we would continually give thanks no matter the circumstances. And may we not hinder or restrain you and how you want to move in any way. We yield to your Holy Spirit today. Be Lord. Be our one. 
be our only and be our all. May the church bow and adore you. And may this nation be covered and delivered and healed by your glory. Amen. Amen. Bless this house. Thank you for listening to this message. We have many more messages and teachings on YouTube and on our website. For all our current events and services, please join our mailing list. Much love and God bless.